Welcome back. The world of Frostpunk takes place in an alternate version of 1886, where the Earth has been thrown into a cold, wintry apocalypse. Millions of people have fled south to escape the freezing temperatures, and those who remain must now learn to survive in the harsh conditions of the frozen north. With the now fallen British Empire leading the construction of massive heat generators to protect a chosen few, the fate of humanity is at stake. And with Frostpunk 2 coming out in a month, set in the universe's version of 1917, I thought it would be interesting to explore the world of Frostpunk, and the state of society, and the climate, and technology in this alternate 1886. So join me as we explore the lore of the universe of Frostpunk and cover how the world got into the current state it's in. The events of Frostpunk 1 take place in an alternate universe to our own, where the technology of the Victorian era has vastly exceeded what was capable in our own time. The apparent key factor for this rapid advancement in technology comes about in Frostpunk's earliest documented lore event. In 1822, the British mathematician Charles Babbage conceives of a steam-driven calculating machine that would be able to compute tables of numbers. In our timeline, the British government funded this project, which subsequently failed. In the world of Frostpunk, however, Babbage succeeded in building his difference engine, an automatic mechanical calculator designed to tabulate polynomial functions, essentially creating a bare-bones prototype of a computer. This success led to more interest in computing technology, leading the British government to invest more heavily in Babbage's experiments. Compared to our world, Babbage, along with fellow mathematician Ada Lovelace, was able to build the analytical engine, the successor to the difference engine, creating essentially the world's first general purpose computer, decades before one would exist in our own timeline. Over the decades, Charles Babbage's analytical engine continued to be improved and made smaller with each generation by other scientists and engineers, until a new type of computational engine was invented that is capable of following orders and performing complex tasks. This new technological golden age would further solidify the British Empire as the world's premier superpower. With access to their vast networks of resources fueling their new forms of technology, they became the most industrialised and scientifically advanced nation prior to the Great Winter. It was during this time that several inventions were made that would prove to be vital in the coming decades. Examples of which being the steam cores and the automatons. It's unclear exactly what a steam core is, however most of the discussion online leads me to believe that steam cores are essentially small steam powered computers capable of calculations and advanced processing. You can see this a little bit in the actual gameplay of Frostpunk where steam cores are required to build more advanced buildings and automatons, which would make sense as, as both of these constructions would possibly require a higher level of organization that would come from a computing matrix, especially the automaton. Speaking of, it's in this pre-winter period of the mid 19th century that the first automatons are created. These giant steam powered robots operate with a combination of complex clockwork mechanism, Babbage's advanced computational engine and the application of a steam core processing. Considered the pinnacle of human engineering before the Great Frost, they are a massive boon to the British economy, allowing its empire to automate much of its labour further propelling the British Empire to becoming the world's greatest superpower. Many other nations attempting to copy or reverse engineer the design, but many more opting to buy automatons from the British. However, all would not be well in the world of Frostpunk, as the world moved into the year 1886, also known as Zero BGF, with BGF being a new dating system to signify before the Great Frost. In the summer of 1886, the Great Frost began. Initially, it presented itself as a chain of strange weather patterns. A frost during summer, killer snowstorms in the northern countries, never-ending rainstorms in the Sahara, and an increasing drop in the temperatures worldwide. To investigate this new weather phenomenon, several nations sent research teams to the northern latitudes, many of these being equipped with the steam heat towers that would later prove to be the saviour of the refugees who would flee north after the Great Frost. With the climate of the Earth rapidly worsening, the general societal atmosphere continued to deteriorate. As crop harvest began to fail, starvation set in. As the situation dragged on, desperate people fled south in search of warmer weather and sources of food. This caused bloating in refugees of southern nations in Africa, the Middle East, and parts of Asia and Australia as refugees flooded into those nations who lacked both the will and resources to care for all of them. Seeing that it was only a matter of time before the entire northern hemisphere was covered in ice, the British government devised a plan to save the population of the British Isles. This twofold plan involved first sending multiple naval vessels with refugees to their colonial holdings in South America, East and South Africa, India, Australia, 
and most of Asia, where it was warmer. The second point of this plan would involve sending icebreakers and purpose-built land dreadnoughts with refugees to the farthest reaches of, of the resource-rich north, where members of the British science expedition had finished the production of heat-producing generators, where a chosen few would survive the environmental catastrophe, with the ultimate goal of these refugees being the ones who would be able to restart civilization following the Great Frost due to the large amount of resources in the north, both left behind by the science teams that had been previously sent there, and the natural resources uncovered by the Great Frost, such as mountains of coal and other resources. It was in the waning months of 1886 that the world would see the last autumn before the eternal winter set in, with the everlasting cold bringing about famine, starvation, and bread riots all throughout Britain, and with the other areas of its colonial empire having been ravaged by the increasingly dangerous weather, the British government, robbed of any other option, began mobilising all available resources to carry out a complete evacuation of the British Isles, with the intent of evacuating as many people as possible into the coal-rich north to save what could still be saved of the British Empire. Ships were built or seized in order to transport both workers and resources to the far north. The Imperial Exploration Company was tasked with the goal of navigating to the sites of the British Science Expedition's research outposts and constructing heat generation towers thus creating safe havens for the people of Britain to survive throughout the approaching cold, eventually re-establish both the Empire and human civilization in the Northern Hemisphere. All of the generators and people we find at Frostbank are the result of this evacuation. However, the first phase of their plan would largely fail, as an ice storm of apocalyptic proportions came from the south, devouring nearly everything in its path, and severing all communications and travel between Britain and the rest of its empire. Robbed of options, the British government began putting into motion their last ditch effort to evacuate London and the rest of the country, with the few who could escaping to the greater empire, while the remnants of Britain fled north, hoping to secure a place among those sent to the heat generators. Once the Great Frost arrived in force following the Great Ice Storm in the winter of 1886, it more or less consumed the entire northern hemisphere, with civilization there beginning to collapse. With the doom slowly approaching, the British Empire's last act before its collapse was to mobilize any available transport to ship citizens to the northern generator sites and with that ended the British Empire and nearly all organized governments worldwide. With the United Kingdom, the United States and the British Dominions being reduced to little more than scattered groups of survivors and refugees and those in northern latitudes desperately trying to make their way to the generator sites. We know of several of these new settlements in the frozen wasteland of the north, now collectively known as the Frostland, possibly the largest of these being Winterhome, a generator site under the control of the British government prior to being taken over in a military coup. After the fall of London and the collapse of the British Empire, massive amounts of refugees arrived fleeing Britain. This caused major strife within Winterhome and a riot broke out over food shortages and increasingly harsh rule by an army captain. Before the generator exploded from a lack of oversight, most of the city's denizens perished either from the explosion itself or the resulting chaos. Some left the fallen city and established ad hoc encampments across the rest of the region. All those that remained in the winter home eventually succumbed first to cannibals and then to exposure. Another notable city in Frostland was Tesla City, founded by survivors of an American expedition under the leadership of Nikola Tesla. They too were sent north to study the strange weather patterns and the advent of the Great Frost. Using his great intelligence and technical know-how, Tesla founded both his namesake city and Tesla Manufacturing, an engineering and manufacturing company that could very well be the largest contemporary production facility in the world following the Great Frost. Tesla Manufacturing had complete monopoly over the city, holding ownership of every single building and had the capacity to produce highly advanced pieces of technology which included prosthetics and the steam cores. Ostensibly to ensure humanity's survival in the frozen wasteland, Nikola Tesla grew to rule the city with an iron fist. Those who could not work efficiently enough were either exiled or abandoned. Consequently, his utilitarian principles of progress and efficiency were viewed as dehumanizing by the people in his charge, who saw themselves as mere cogs in Tesla's soulless machine. At some unknown point, Nikola Tesla attempted to implement an electricity field designed to shield his city against the encroaching snow. He eventually succeeded in creating a dome of electrical energy which kept the ice and snow from engulfing the city proper. However, uh, like most fictional things with Tesla's name attached, the field was either flawed at its inception or eventually developed a critical malfunction, as it was somehow altered to electrocute humans within its radius, essentially vaporizing every single inhabitant of Tesla City, turning them into 
nothing but charred corpses and ash. The final settlement located in Frostland is the city of New London, which we take control of in Frostpunk's new home campaign. New London was a settlement founded by a group of survivors fleeing London itself. It may be the last refuge of human civilization against the bitter cold, as the nearby cities of Winterhome and Tesla City had fallen by this stage. Throughout the events of the campaign, the citizens learn of the fate of the other great cities of Frostland and how they may be the last surviving city in the Northern Hemisphere. Through the campaign, the city of New London can gain purpose either through their faith or order, with them potentially crossing the line into zealotry or despotism, having to endure the civil unrest that would follow. New London and the rest of Frostland, however, would have to face a threat greater than that. One that would come from without, rather than within. As in 1887, one year after the fall of the Empire, a massive storm the likes of which hadn't been seen before was bearing down on New London. A storm of that size would almost certainly destroy New London, killing all of its inhabitants and destroying all that they had built. The storm itself bordered on the unnatural in its intensity and its persistence. Once it arrived, it would plunge New London into nearly a week of perpetual darkness, biting cold and endless wind. Once it did arrive, hot houses would essentially become worthless as the soil freezed over, and any edible wildlife would have retreated into hiding to wait out the storm, rendering hunting equally as worthless. Meaning that at this point, New London would have to subsist entirely on stockpiled rations of food to sustain them. As the storm continued, it became near impossible for people to work outside, with most of the work being done by what automatons New London had at their disposal. As the days ground on and the storm progressively worsened, becoming colder and colder, when it seemed that all hope was lost for the city of London, it was discovered by one of the engineers of the city that the storm was near its end. However, the absolute worst would come just before its end. The estimated lowest temperature would be that the storm would bottom out at around 100 just prior to the storm's end. Even with the generator fully upgraded and a well-fed, full power population in fully insulated homes, there would be no possible way to withstand that temperature. And there was a very real risk of New London literally freezing solid overnight. After what seemed like an eternity of hell, the people of New London began to notice that the ambient light was increasing and the clouds were thinning. The howling of the wind had died down. As people began to crack open their previously frozen front doors and venture out of their homes for the first time, they could see that the storm had in fact dissipated and though there were many deaths from the prior extreme cold snap, many more of London's, of New London's population had been left relatively intact. Almost as quickly as it had arrived, the storm had dissipated, and the temperature skyrocketed back up to a relatively warm negative 20 degrees Celsius. This meant that the survivors of New London would be able to venture out of their city for the first time, and attempt to reclaim some of the other areas of Frostland. And with that, we round off pretty much everything we know definitively about the story of Frostpunk 1. From what we know so far about the details, Frostpunk 2 is set 30 years later in 1917, with the focus of that game being on the transition to oil as a power source instead of coal, as by this point in the game's chronology, coal is unable to meet the demands of New London's power. So I expect we can see Frostpunk 2's atmosphere to focus both on the planet's deteriorating climate, now how the people of New London's ideology evolves, and what differences may arise between the newly formed sister settlements. Furthermore, Frostpunk 2's aesthetic is more heavily focused on diesel punk as opposed to the steampunk aesthetic Frostpunk 1 originally had, meaning that the game may tonally shift, meaning that a lot of the architecture and design of the game will be different compared to Frostpunk 1. But regardless, I hope this video was at least in some way illuminating, and if there's nothing else, have a great rest of your day.